All right, we're going to get started here. I see some familiar faces out there, so that's good to see on there. Um, thanks for joining us and tuning in uh, tonight on our second of our four town halls. Um, the last two, week, two weeks ago, we did Bridges Out of Poverty and ALICE, which is an acronym for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. I can't believe I got that. And so uh, if you didn't get a chance to view that, it is out on the city's website and it's worth, each one builds on, on the other. So um, feel free to go out onto the city's website and take a look at session number one also. Tonight's session is, is about understanding concepts of housing and homelessness, the housing spectrum. And we have a, quite a panel of in, individuals here um, my name is Joe Cruz. I'm a member of the Housing Coalition. Um, also in our lineup is Emily, who is the chair of the Housing Coalition. Krista, who is from the Salvation Army. Morgan, who's from Lakeshore Cap. Abby, who's from, also from Lakeshore, Lakeshore Cap. Steve, Stephen who's from the Warming Center, the Sheboygan County Warming Center, and then the, hopefully we're going to have some lived experience individual, uh, Michael, who may be joining us remotely, virtually, or he may join us in person. We will find that out. So a couple of housekeeping um, items. Please keep yourself muted during the presentations and the, the discussions. If you have questions, we really want your questions. This is a town hall. So feel free to write them down, to be able to share with us at the end when we open up for that so that you will have a time period when we will unmute the mics. Or you could put them in to the chat area and uh, we will field them a little bit later on. So let's get started on the housing spectrum and finding out a little bit more about what all goes into understanding housing. So Emily? Hi, uh, my name is Emily Kinney. Um, as Joe said, I am the co-chair no, of the Housing mic's Coalition. Not my, on. my mic is, oh, there we go. Hey, there we go. Um, hi, my name is Emily Kundi. I am one of the co-chairs of the Housing Coalition, Shawin County's Housing Coalition. Um, and I still look like Joe. Am I you supposed just to move, be talking you just yet? move your mouth while I'm talking. It'll be great. <laughs> so, um, when we look at this, uh, we do have a, a, a slideshow presentation, which I think is what we're, we're looking to pull up here. But um, So my name is Emily Kundi. I am the co-chair for the Housing Coalition. I'm also uh, the behavioral health manager for the production farm in Sheboygan County. Um, and tonight we're going to be talking about understanding housing complexities. Now, I'm going to be really clear. I'm way too deep in the weeds with this PowerPoint. So you're going to love all the details. But the nice thing is we're really we're going to try and get the slides out to you. So um, you will have the information that I have in front of me later on. In addition to that, as Joe said, there will be a digital recording of this coming out in the future as well. So if your friends want to see it and you know, your neighbors, your community members are interested in it and you felt like it was worthwhile, you certainly could suggest it to them um, and they can watch it later. Um, this, we are doing four town halls, as Joe said. The next one is on Thursday, February 17th. Um, the sign-up will be forthcoming, just like it was for this one. We're doing each of them individually, so please consider uh, joining us for the third town hall as well. The last town hall is actually going to be a panel discussion. We're going to have a group of people up here that will be here to answer any questions that are remaining. Um, we'll have a lived experience, I'm sure, at that point. More than one lived experience on the panel um, as we move forward. Um, you also may be asked to complete a survey at some point. So the only way that we can improve these and get them to start running better or the way that you're looking for them to run is to get some of the feedback from the community. So if you have an opinion about how these ran or other topics that you'd like to see in the future, um, you don't need to wait. You can let us know. Um, there'll definitely be ways to contact us as we move forward. So can we get the um, PowerPoint running? There we go. So we're understanding housing complexities. This is Town Hall 2. It is February 3rd, 2022. Um, so we can slide on to the next slide here. Um, the next slide talks about just what I just told you. So those are some of the details of what's forthcoming. Um, 
and we can go to the next slide. So we're actually going to talk about some of the concepts that I'll be reviewing tonight. Uh, some of these might be really in depth and I'm going to really try and break them down so that they make sense. We're going to talk about the cost of living, the living wage, uh, what is housing and urban development or HUD? Like you may have heard like blah, 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 HUD standards. Let's explain what that means. Um, we're going to talk about what fair market rent is. What if, what's the term affordable housing really mean? Um, we also going to talk a little bit about median market rent and what that means as well. Um, I think one of the most common things that people don't understand is the difference between low income housing and income based housing. So we're going to talk about that. Um, we're also going to talk about some of the pros and cons of renting versus buying and what vacancy rates are. I think vacancy rates are a super important concept. They're going to get discussed further um, as we move through the town halls. But at the same time, people are like, what does that mean and why is that important? I had a very difficult time finding where to put it in my list of concepts. So um, we will, but we'll try and break that down a little bit so it makes sense as well as we move forward. So um, that's what I'm going to be talking about as quickly as possible so everyone else gets a chance to talk. Um, let's talk about cost of living. Uh, the definition of cost of living is the total cost of living in a community. What does it cost to actually live somewhere? Um, those costs include housing, utilities, food, transportation, education, childcare, health, and there's some other concepts. So if you look at the little uh, graphic that's on here, I compared Sheboygan and Mantuak on a really cool tool that's out there in the community. You can just Google cost of living comparison and you can kind of get an idea. So if we look at this, the cost of living, according to this, in Manitowoc versus Sheboygan is a 7.3% cheaper to live in Manitowoc than it is in Sheboygan. So when we look at this, the index is based on 100 is the national average. So when we look at that, like it's the concept of is it cheaper or more expensive to live here than it is nationally somewhere else. So when you look at the ideas around Sheboygan, um, Food and groceries here, we're at like 92.6% of the national average where it's cheaper to buy groceries in Manitowoc. Um, so, uh, you know, how much does it cost to buy a home in one community versus the other? And anyone who's actually been looking for apartments or housing, oftentimes it'll show you when you look online what other communities around you, what their rent looks like. And you can definitely tell that in Manitowoc County, the rent is cheaper. Um, it's just less expensive. Uh, the home ownership is cheaper in Manitowoc and less expensive as well. And I'm sure there's a lot of reasons why that's the case, and I'm sure that they're going to catch up to us at some point. But right now, it does cost more to live in Sheboygan than it does in a similar community like Manitowoc. Um, so it's, like I said, it's based on the national average, and it can be cared, compared across communities. I did it with Fond du Lac. I did it with Milwaukee just to kind of get a feel for it. Um, but I figured Manitowoc is a community that a lot of us are very familiar with, and it's not that much smaller than Sheboygan. So what does that look like? Um, our utility costs, there's a huge difference. Uh, transportation is a difference as well. So um, these, you know, are as updated as possible. But just to get a feel for what that looks like. So what does it cost to live somewhere? Um, and that's important when we're deciding about housing and um, how much things, how much money we have total to live. Can we skip to the next slide? All right. So now we have an idea of what the cost of living is. Let's talk about a living wage. So when we talk wage, it's a wage that is high enough to maintain a normal standard of living. So, you know, you might have heard the fight for 15 or the, I think it went back in the day, it was like the fight for 10. Um, now it's the fight for 15 where they're looking to move that minimum wage up to $15 an hour. And people have a lot of opinions about that one way or the other, but ultimately what people are looking for is a living wage. They're looking for the ability to work full time and be able to afford to live without assistance. So when, when we look at that, like what's the living wage allowed? It allows for you to pay all of your bills. It allows your children to be cared for. Um, your transportation is covered, whether it be uh, public transportation, whether it be a vehicle with insurance and gas and maintenance, that your food budget is covered. You have enough money to eat for the entire month um, and that there's no ongoing financial assistance required to survive. So you're not uh, relying on food share. You're not relying on badger care. You're not relying on um, housing assistance. You have enough money to be able to sustain yourself and your family for the duration of that month and ongoing. That's a living wage. So when people talk about that concept around like the fight for 15, there's reasons for that. They want people to be able to live working full time. So let's go to the next slide here. The next slide just kind of talks about what is the living wage for Sheboygan. So when we look at this, it talks about one adult, two adults working, or uh, or one adult working with a two-family home, um, and then 
both adults working full time. And that's kind of the assumption here. So we talk about what is the poverty wage, what is the minimum wage, in Wisconsin the minimum wage is $7.25 an hour for a non-tip profession, so that is the minimum wage. So if someone were working minimum wage full time, like look at the difference in the, the amount for that. Depending on how many people you have living in your home, how much does it actually cost to reside in that community? Um, I can't even say, like most of my stats, just so you're aware, come from 2021. Um, there are some updated stats as we move into 2022. Some of these move quicker than others, and we'll talk about that. I just want to keep my stats more or less consistent, so I did try and stay across the board on 2021 as much as I could. So this is kind of what the idea was in 2021. One of the things just to be aware of is with COVID and the pandemic and the way things ran, you can't always get the statistics, the most up-to-date statistics because of some of those transitions. So I believe most of what I have here is 2021. So look at what it costs. Like if you have two children, you need to be making $36 an hour to be able to afford to raise two children. So when you look at the cost for childcare and you look for the cost of other pieces, that's what they're looking at. Um, I, not to get too personal, but I have three kids. Um, we had one and then we ended up with twins. So I was like, oh, we can afford a second kid. And then we had three. <laughs> you can't put one back. So, you know, at that point, then if I were by myself, I would need to make $46 an hour to be able to afford the three children that I ended up with. So um, I do not make $46 an hour. Um, so good thing I got another adult working in my home. Um, so when we look at that, like that's, that's what we're talking about is the reality of this. So when we tell people to kind of pull up by themselves up by their bootstraps and to go out there and find a job and that you could succeed and you won't need any assistance if you just try harder, this is how much harder you have to try. And this is what the wage they'd have to make to make this make sense and to get off of all of assistance and be able to afford to live independently. So uh, just to get an idea of that. All right, let's keep moving. Now we're going to talk about HUD. Uh, okay, so this slide is super busy. It's got tons of information on it. Um, what is HUD? It's the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, it's responsible for national policy and programs that address American housing need um, that improve and develop the nation's communities and enforce fair housing laws. So that you can go on HUD.gov, and they've got all sorts of legalese and fun... All, yeah, yeah, and you want to sleep, you could certainly hit HUD. Um, they run um, or participate in many programs intended to, they support home ownership, increasing safe and affordable rental housing, reduce homelessness, the fight for housing discrimination, like there's all sorts of pieces of what they do. They um, foster FHA loans, uh, the community development home partnership block grants, they subsidize some block grants, they subsidize some housing, um, including Section 8 housing, and they have assistance for supporting homeless individuals. So. Um, there's a lot of different pieces to what they do, um, but HUD sets the definition for homelessness. So there's been a lot of questions about why does your income have to be a certain point? Or why can't I get assistance, you know, when I make this much money versus someone who gets that much, makes that much money or is in this housing situation versus someone who's in this housing situation? Um, why can't they get into shelter? Or why can't they get support to, you know, to avoid being homeless? They have uh, four categories of homelessness uh, according to HUD. So the number one is the literal homelessness, that you have to literally be homeless, and that's the standard by a lot of programs. It's uh, sleeping on the street, a place not meant for habitation, or um, a shelter. If you're staying in one of those, you are category one homeless according to HUD. Category two um, is at imminent risk of homelessness. So you're gonna be homeless within 14 days, you don't have anywhere else to go, and there's no shelters available to you. So when you look at that, it's, um, I'm sorry, no, there's no other resources available to you. Like you don't have a, a huge savings account. You don't have a brother who has a five bedroom mansion. You don't have anywhere else necessarily to go and you're going to lose your housing in 14 days. So that's category two. Category three is homeless under other federal statutes. So let's think about what is another federal statute that has to do with homelessness. That one of those I think is the McKinney-Vento Act. So it really is looking at youth under the age of 25, especially unaccompanied minors, and then families that qualify, like I said, under McKinney-Vento. So when we talk about that, there's people who haven't necessarily been on a lease in over 60 days. They've moved two or more times in the last 60 days. Um, or, and, I'm sorry, it's not, or it's an and, 
they're going to continue to struggle with these issues. It's not suddenly going to magically fix, or they're not going to suddenly magically have a place to live. It's that we can expect them to continue to struggle. Those individuals that we're talking about, we're talking about couch surfers. We're talking about people who are doubled up. We're talking about um, individuals who are unaccompanied minors, who are under 18 and can't sign a lease, but they don't have an adult that's responsible for them. Under the um, federal guidelines in the funding around homelessness, they're not eligible for those funding. Um, but they can get other supports. So we have a McGinney Vento liaison in the Sheboygan Area School District. There are McGinney Vento liaisons in every district in the community, um, in every community. So they can help support with things like free lunch, making sure kids get in school, and helping with other pieces. Um, our McKinney Vento liaison in Sheboygan is fantastic. She's a really nice lady, um, and she's supporting our homeless population in Sheboygan, uh, the city of Sheboygan, and we really appreciate her. Um, so when we look at that, the fourth category is fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence. So when they talk about domestic violence, they're talking about sexual violence, domestic violence. There's a lot of different definitions under domestic violence, but again, they have to have no other housing options and no other resources to support themselves. And then they can also be considered homeless under the guidelines of HUD. So when we look at that, we're talking about like this really narrow view. You, you know, like it's not necessarily sleeping in a cardboard box, but perhaps you're sleeping in a car. Perhaps you're sleeping in a tunnel slide in the park. Perhaps you're sleeping in an encampment in one of our, like, forested parks. Um, you know, when we talk about that, or you're staying at the Salvation Army, or you're staying at the Warming Center, those are the individuals that are considered Category 1 homeless. Um, and those are the ones that they prioritize for um, helping with housing. And when we look at that, that's going to get discussed further as we move down the table to my left, which is fantastic. But I just want to give you an idea that, that HUD has a huge impact in all these pieces, and there's regulations that go beyond Lake Shore Cap, that go beyond the Salvation Army, that go beyond the Warming Center and Safe Harbor and all of our other awesome places that help and support the individuals who are homeless, that they have these rules they have to follow in order to continue to be funded to support the people in our community. So it's not always a choice that they make. Sometimes it's a decision that's made by the federal government. So I just felt like that was a really good piece for the community to understand. If we keep moving, we're going to talk about fair market rent. Okay, FMR. I don't think anyone ever says that, but fair market rent is determined also by HUD. So when we look at that, HUD decides excuse me, what the rates are for fair market rent. Fair market rent includes rent and utilities, but it doesn't include phone service or any other services. So your internet or like your cable television or any of those other pieces that people typically have in a normal industrialized community like we have here, it doesn't cover any of that. We're just talking about rent and utilities. So the S this estimates the 40th percentile of the area total rental costs. So when you look at that, that means that like, 60, um, for every rental that we're talking about, 60 of them of the 100 are going to be more expensive and 39 are going to be less expensive. So it's this really kind of moderately low um, rent, but not super low rent. Um, it's significantly below what rent actually costs in Sheboygan. So when you understand that, I'm talking like rent. I'm not even talking rent plus utilities. It's, it's fairly low. Um, it sets the payment standards for federal housing assistance programs. So the federal government decides what this number is going to be, and then we have to kind of adhere to it locally, and the assistance that's offered is all based on this amount. And it's going to get discussed further as we move down the table. But I just want you to understand the concepts around it. Um, it can be differentiated between metropolitan and, and versus small areas. So our fair market rent is not compared to Milwaukee's fair market rent. It's compared to other communities and, and communities of our size. So we are listed under the small areas caveat of there. Um, it's not a one size fits all communities kind of approach. Um, it also does not connect to luxury housing. So if there's luxury housing in your community, it doesn't get considered within the fair market rent, which I thought was interesting and unusual at the same time. So. Um, when we looked at this and I looked at the numbers, the fair market rent in our area is, is more expensive than 50% of the other fair market areas in our region, um, which was I thought was an unusual stat, um, but that's where we're at. So uh, as we look at that, this is 2021 again. I was told that Morgan's going to talk to you a little bit more about this as we move down, but she has the 2022 stats. They've come out already. So I, like I said, I was trying to keep every, all my stats in line. So in 2021, these are what the fair market rents were for Sheboygan. So um, with this again, rent and utilities. So 
your gas, your electric, your water, your sewer, your garbage removal, everything needs to be under 769 to be considered part of, for like a two bedroom if we're looking at the fair market rent for our community. So anyone who's been out there looking at apartments right now, it's really very difficult to find a two bedroom apartment for less than 750 just for the rent. Um, so when you look at that, like that leaves you $19 for utility costs. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, it's a really tricky number. So when we look at this, if we're basing it off of fair market rent, it's really even more difficult to find an apartment that's going to match with this. So let's talk about what is affordable housing then. If we move to the next slide here. The definition of affordable housing is housing that a household can pay for while still having money left over for other necessities like food, transportation, and health care. The federal government typically defines housing as affordable when it consumes no more than 30% of a household's income. So when we look at your income, you know, we're looking at that 30%, it's 30% of your net income. So it's taking out things like your taxes, your medical coverage, and other expenses. So based on what money you take home, you don't want to spend more than 30% of that on housing-related costs. So again, that's kind of going to that same idea of the fair market rent. So it's your rent, your utilities, your garbage, you know, all of those pieces, that should all fall under 30% of your take-home income. So housing costs are, um, I think we talked about all those. It does not include your phone, your internet, your TV. The goal is if you only spend 30% on your housing, you will have money for your cell phone, your house phone, um, maybe some internet service, some cable services, I don't know, like gas for your car, um, you know, school clothes for your kids, all those pieces. So the goal is to put your housing costs at a certain level so that you can afford the rest of that cost of living that we were talking about. So let's move on to the next slide here. We'll talk a little bit about median rent. So that we're talking like mid-range rent. That's like 50% or higher, 50% or lower. We're just talking that mid-range rent in a community. Um, the median rent for Sheboygan is, for a two bedroom, is about $819. Um, this is not fair market rent, and remember we talk about fair market rent includes the utilities in it. We're just talking about the 50th percentile for rent in Sheboygan. So what can someone who's working full time at minimum wage afford? So we're back to the idea of 725. So you're working at 725 an hour for 40 hours a week for 52 weeks a year. That brings us to $15,080 a year. So we only want to spend 30% of that, and that's gross. So we're not even looking at the net. We're just looking at gross here. When we look at that, we're going to take 30% of that and put that towards our rent. So annually, we don't want to spend more than $4,524 in rent. If we divide that by 12 months, we're looking at a housing cost of $377 a month. So if you're working full time, you can't afford more than $377 with utilities for your rent. So you can't afford to live in Sheboygan without assistance if you're working full time at minimum wage. So we talk about that cost of living and that living wage, that's way below a living wage for Sheboygan. So, you know, even we have these people that are working, working their bottoms off to really just work full time and 40 hours at jobs that are paying $7.25 an hour and they're not able to make it. There's no way. There's no way to stop going to Starbucks and have enough to, to pay your rent or there's not enough to like, oh, if I cut my cable or I drop my internet, then I'll be able to afford to live. There's no way to afford to live on minimum wage full time in Sheboygan. Um, the numbers don't lie. I've got the math right there. There's just no way to do it. Um, we don't have a lot of apartments that are 377 a month or less with utilities included. Um, I, I haven't seen any. Anyone here seen any? No, we've all kind of been looking too, I imagine. So, so how much would you have to make an hour working full time to afford a two bedroom at a median rental rate? So like just that mid range rent. How much, how many hours or what, how much would we have to make? So we're doing a kind of reverse math here. Now, I wanted to include utilities in this so that we can, can get that whole housing cost. So when I looked up utilities, I was like, oh, I'm going to guess like 150 a month. I think that when I looked at that cost of living, it was actually 170 for a two bedroom. But when we look at it, we're looking at 12 times 819 plus 150 because we're going to do a two bedroom, right? So we put that in together and we're going to say this is how much our rent is going to be a year with utilities is 11,628. So again, you know what? We want 30% of our income. So that is our income is going to have to be 38,760 divided by 52 weeks a year divided by 40 hours a week. Because we're going to work full time, right? All year, every year. And you have to make a minimum of 1863 an hour. So if you want to afford a two bedroom in Sheboygan and have it be 30% of your gross, not even your net, 
your gross income, you need to make a minimum of 1863 an hour. This is the barest minimum you can make. Now, I also want to talk about the fact that you can't have unpaid days off. There's no wiggle room here. There's no, like, oh, no, I got COVID and my employer's not going to pay me for these two weeks I've been sitting at home. Um, it's not going to be where I'm working through a temp agency at 1863 an hour and I need to take some days off for a funeral and it's not covered. Um, none of that is covered. So if you take days off, that, that's going to mess with this. Now you're in trouble. So when we look at this, you know, there are some employers in our community that do pay 1863 an hour, and there are some great employers in Sheboygan County. They're doing a great job for our employees. But you've got to be able to get to that job. When we talked about transportation last time, you have to be able to consistently get to the job. You have to have consistent child care, and child care is expensive and hard to come by for some of the shifts that might pay 1863 an hour. There's a lot of components to this. It's not just like, oh, well, I make 1863 an hour, now I'm, I'm solid, I've got it. There's a lot of pieces to this. Um, and I know, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting old. In 819 and, uh, for a two-bedroom, I'm like, holy cats. Like, before I purchased my house, I was paying 405 for a three-bedroom. But, you know, that was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away in Sheboygan County. So um, that's not what we're experiencing anymore. So 819 is not an unusual amount to pay for a two-bedroom in Sheboygan for just a mid-range apartment. So as we keep going here, we're going to talk a little bit more. We're going to get off this heaviness and talk about the difference between in low income and income based housing. So a lot of people have feelings like, oh, you know, there's just all this low income housing. There's all these ability for people with low income to get housing in Sheboygan County. And there really isn't a ton of low income housing in Sheboygan. We have Ridge Court, formerly known as Eisner Court. We have Camelot Manor, which I always call the Carmen Avenue Apartments because they're on Carmen Avenue, Parkwood, which is over by South High School, and Georgia Avenue. Um, those for the city of Sheboygan are our low-income housing units. Um, another way to get low-income housing would be working with a Section 8 voucher, which is typically closed and it's hard to get. Um, there's a lot of pieces to that too, but it's designed for those in our community that are lower income. The tenant pays 30% of the, their income to housing. So it takes that model the federal government says and says like, 30% is what we should be paying, you pay 30%. You make more money, you pay more rent. You make less money, you pay less rent. But we're looking at 30%. So those are just some opportunities. When we look at that, you can't have evictions. You gotta have a decent um, rental history. You have to have a decent credit history to get in there. Um, you know, can't have any evictions on your record. There's a lot of barriers to even getting into low income housing. So I don't wanna make it sound like, hey, these apartments are available and everybody who needs them can just move into them. There's a lot of pieces to this. But let's talk about what income based housing is instead. So the Washington School Apartments are income based. The Badger State Lofts have some income based. There are a couple other places. I know that Partners had a place and Sunnyside was doing some income based. There were some other places in Sheboygan over the years that have had this because typically what happens is, is that um, individuals who, who build the buildings get a subsidy from the government to put in some lower income rent units into the building and for a certain period of time, and then they get tax breaks and they get some incentives to do this. But it's set for a certain period of time for a certain number of apartments. So when we look at like the Washington School Apartments, not all of those apartments are meant for people that are lower incomes or in the income base area. Just a certain number of them are. Um, and when we look at it, the, some of these buildings were like this, but then they're not anymore. You get a certain number of years. So there were a couple of them, like the shoe factory was had some income base units in it. There was some on 8th Street. Yeah, it's been since... Okay, so income base for 20 years, that's a long time. You know, and some of that has expired from some of the older ones that we've had before. And that's a good period of time. But when we look at what does income base mean? Income base means that you can't make over a certain amount of money and live there. You have to be at, what does it say? Like I think 50 to 60% of the community's median income. So the median income from 2019, which is the last I could get from the census, was 51,104 for the city of Sheboygan. So that's the median income. So the median is the mean, median, mode. Look at my stats stuff coming back here. Me, median is the middle number. So mode is the most frequently occurring. Um, mean, mean, mean is the average. So right now we're talking about median, which means middle. So 50% of the people are making more than that. 50% are making less than that. It's the middle. Or, no, it isn't. That's not 50% not is making more, 50 is making less. It's this is the top salary in Sheboygan, this is the lowest salary in Sheboygan, and this is the middle range between those two. So when we talk about someone who maybe owns a factory in Sheboygan, they're taking home 
this much money, whereas we, we already learned what someone making minimum wage full time is making. So it's the number halfway between those two numbers is the 51,104. So when we look at that, you can make 56% of that. Um, and the rent is set at 30% of the median income. So rent is, when we look at that, 30% of 51,104 means that the rent is $1,277. We've already established that's not affordable, but it is what we're talking about when we talk about income-based housing. Now, I will tell you right now that that's adjusted for apartment size. So if it's a one bedroom, it's probably gonna be less than that. If it's a three bedroom, it might be more than that. But that is, that it's based on um, the size of the apartment. So it's not a one size fits all with this either. But when you look at it, you have to make under a certain amount of money to live there. But you can't, so you can't make over a certain amount, but you still have to pay that amount in rent. So it ends up being kind of a tricky spot for people because it's hard to get ahead or it's hard to save money. It's hard to, to put yourself in the situation where you're then um, succeeding or, or thriving, I guess, beyond surviving. So $1,277 a month is an income-based housing. So when we make judgments about that and you're like, oh, they got an income-based housing spot, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily paying less rent than um, other people in the community. It really just depends on the apartment. Probably less rent than other people in the building but not necessarily less, less, less rent than other people in the community. Um, so we move on to, like, let's talk about the difference between renting and owning. The pros of renting, basically, like, your furnace dies, your landlord's going to pay for that. Uh, a tree falls on your house, landlord's paying for that. You don't have to pay any property taxes, so there's no, like, hidden fees in that. Um, you pay what you owe each month. Um, it's also easier to move and change neighborhoods. So... Um, Bob Dole moves next door and you don't like him. He's, you know, he's loud and his dog barks all night and you don't want to live in that neighborhood anymore. You can move, you know, and Bob Dole's passed away RIP to Bob, Bob Dole. I'm sorry, I reference him all the time. Um, you know, there's really some nice, easy pieces to renting. So when we look at that, like, there, there's just definite pros to renting. You can, it's short term. You don't, you don't, you don't love it. You don't have to live there forever. You can move. Um, home ownership it builds equity. Um, you know, it's usually considered good debt, so you, you have the positives of that. You also have the autonomy of owning pets, painting, adjusting your living dwelling to how it fits you. You know, you want a new deck and you get a building permit, you make a new deck. So there's a lot of pieces to owning a home. Um, there's also that stability. There's no more moving. You don't have to get your piano to another dwelling, which after you hit a certain age, your friends do not want to move you anymore, and they especially don't want to move your piano, just to be really super clear. It's, it's the truth. Um, so when we look at that, there, there are definitely some pros to home ownership, but there's difficulties that both of these pieces share. Um, whether you're renting or you're buying, people are checking your credit and your payment history. So, you know, whether you're renting or buying, people want to know, have you been paying your rent? Have you been paying your utilities? Have you absconded? Have you been evicted? Um, there's also a few quality affordable spaces available. So whether you're looking for housing in, in the community or you're, you're looking for rental in the community, there are really very few. And we'll talk about the vacancy rates because that's kind of a nice segue into that, but we'll get to that. Um, there's also, oh, we're not that far yet. We've got to go back again. If that's what I'm talking about. Um, there's also steep competition for each quality space. So when we look at that, everybody and their dog has applied to rent that apartment. You know, so basically, or, or that house. Like I have friends who are looking for to buy a house and basically, you know, you gotta just kind of like cross your fingers and hope that you, you bid high enough or that they like your face or they like your proposal on paper. There's not enough housing. So people are really, you know, oh, I lost that house again, you know, or like, I really like that one, I was hoping to get it, but then they can, there's lots of people to choose from. Um, there's potentially a steep down payment or security deposit. So one of the things that has happened with the, the change in vacancy rates is this concept around people asking for like a double security deposit or a security deposit and first and month, last month's rent. And now we're like at triple the cost of the apartment. So I didn't do the math on this, but if someone can do like 819 times three, so we're looking at like 16, 24.57, thanks, Chad. Um, so you have to come up with that right off the bat, like to get an apartment, you know, because they can do that because they have so many people to choose from that they could probably find someone who's willing or has that money available. And if you don't, you're now going to lose out on that apartment. So it really puts you kind of in this pickle. Um, plus the down payment for a house, oof. Um, you know, they want you to put a lot of cash down to get your house. And, and honestly, the more cash you put down, the less your monthly payment is. So you do want it to kind of um, put a lot down if you can. Um, and then 
you also have to worry about poor upkeep from the previous tenants or the previous owners. So when you're looking at it and you move in, <laughs> okay, my house was flipped when I bought it 20 years ago. Um, and we're like, oh, it's beautiful. It's so wonderful. They redid the whole thing. And then you move in and realize that they spray painted the grates, but they did it on top of the hardwood floor. So now there's the, you didn't notice that there were squares on the ground of, of um, spray paint. You know, and you gotta, you're be like, oh, man. You, so you have to deal with some of these pieces. Um, I do know that the light switch at the top and the bottom of my steps, both of them turned a light on when I did the walkthrough. When I purchased my house, the bottom one just is for fun at this point. I mean, sometimes you just flip it for fun. You, you end up in these situations where, like, you kind of get what you get. And, you know, and maybe you bid so hard for that house, you know, people were taking off the contingencies. They were taking off, like, the inspection. Well, I just need to own a home. I just want to own a home. I'm going to, you know what, if you choose me, you don't have to have a home inspection. I'll take it as is. So then now you have to deal with what that looks like. Is my foundation safe? You know, is there a raccoon in my chimney? Um, you know, what does that look like? You are kind of left with that situation. So, whether you're buying or renting, you kind of get stuck in that. And everybody knows that there are apartments in Sheboygan that the landlords are not able to or unwilling to keep up, and you're stuck in them. Um, I worked for Head Start for 11 years. I had a family that, when they moved in, did not realize there was no furnace. And um, winter came around, and they're like, well, the thermostat's not turning on. There's no actual furnace in their house. Um, so, and apparently, like, as we move forward, that that was something that had been that way for a long time. So when you look at that, just because we have to get in somewhere sometimes, we settle for a less than desirable building and we have to worry about what that upkeep looks like or what the way things are at. So whether you're renting or buying, there's certain downfalls and pitfalls that are, are pretty static. Let's talk about the vacancy rates. Vacancy rates literally are the amount of open rental units or homes versus the number of those uh, rentals available in the community. So it, there's a little graphic that talks about how to do the math on that. A healthy rental vacancy rate typically hovers around 7 to 8%, and a healthy homeowner vacancy rate is pegged at much lower at like around 2%-ish. The vacancy rate above 12% is considered high, and above 20% is considered hyper-vacancy. So when we look at hyper-vacancy, that's not our problem in Sheboygan, but that's when you're thinking about communities that end up being kind of either ghost towns or there's just like a lot of high crime because there's a lot of open space, you know, open apartments or buildings where nobody is living, so people just kind of squat. So when we look at that, there's dangers to having too many vacancies, but at the same time, we really have a lower vacancy. So um, according to the housing study that Chad's gonna tell you about probably next time we meet, um, the Sheboygan right now is at 3.3%, which is up from 2019, which when it was 1.43%. So when we look at that, there has been a change in the vacancy rates, but there's been, since 2019, there's been some really cool buildings built in Sheboygan apartments and whatnot. Um, you know, I, when you look around, you see a lot of new buildings. So we've increased the amount of housing in Sheboygan County since 2019. So the vacancy rates have changed a little bit. Um, yeah, when it was 1.43, we're all going, what are we going to do about this? Like, where are people living? Um, but rent at that time in 2019 was actually cheaper and less expensive than it is today. So you could get a two-bedroom for less than you can today. Um, so there's some differences in there, too. What does it mean for renters and home buyers when we don't have enough vacancy? There's not enough housing. It's harder to find the right fit. Um, but it's also just harder to find housing. Um, landlords and home sellers have more choice in tenants and buyers, and there's also that supply versus demand, which means that landlords can increase their rent, houses can increase their costs. So we had a really big uh, housing purchase boom here a little bit ago. I think it's starting to die down a little bit, but we, there were people that were offering twenty or thirty thousand above ask, asking for a homeowner uh, for to, to purchase a home. So when you look at that, like it's way more than what it would even be worth when they appraised it because they just, there just was not very many houses out there and people wanted to buy. So it just, it hit this boom where people are paying way more than what the building was worth. And I think we need to be really careful about that because as we move forward and we look at this concept that eventually they may choose to sell, it may not be worth what they paid for it. And that's like one of those first times in history where we're upside down and we're, we're owning something that's not an investment. You're not looking at the equity that you would have normally been looking at when you purchase a house. But the same thing when we look at rents. Rent, there, there's that supply versus demand. You know, we're like, so-and-so can ask this much for an apartment. I'm going to ask for more. And I'm noticing I'm getting like 70,000 tenants applying for one apartment. I could charge more and get more because these people really want to live in my dwelling. So I'm going to start charging more money. Um, so that changes what the market looks like. It looks it changes what our rental 
rent looks like. Um, so an apartment that maybe like 10 years ago would go for 400 is now going for 750 to $800 a month. The building hasn't necessarily been updated to that point, but there's that demand. It's supply versus demand. That's the way America works. So they can charge what they want. In addition to that, we have some concerns around when we have more people than we have space, people can be more picky. I'm not saying that people are out there discriminating against individuals in our community, but there is an opportunity to do so when you have more tenant applicants than you have space. Uh, people can choose to narrow that down however they want, and it can be due to factors that have nothing to do with their ability to pay or their um, status as a good tenant. So, um, you know, there's protected classes for rent, but there's ways to get around that, I think, in our community when there's too many people and not enough buildings. Um, so it is a difficult process. So the vacancy rates really define how in-demand housing is and what's available in our community. So there's a lot of difficulty. In, and even when individuals go to get assistance and there's, there, there's someone who's willing to back them and support them in having that housing, there isn't, still isn't necessarily somewhere they can go. They still have to find an apartment. They still have to find someone willing to rent to them. And that's not an easy process and it doesn't go smoothly all the time. So, and it certainly doesn't happen overnight. Um, as we move forward here, I know that I talk really quickly and I'm really thankful that this is recorded. So if I went too fast, because I'm looking at the table all the way down here and knowing other people need to present, you can rewind it and watch me again. So, oh, what a what a what a, what a, joy. What a deal you what have a there! Joy. I, well, I know. Th thank you, Emily, for um, giving us a very broad and good overview, specific to both renting and ownership and the the difficulties that go along with that. And all the pieces, and I hope I broke down some of those concepts a little bit. Good. And I know it's totally in the weeds, and there's too much here, but you get the slides. You can look at all of my great stuff. And the last slide on my list is actually about the Housing Coalition, uh, a little bit of advertisement for us there. We meet the third Tuesday of each month. Uh, we are currently meeting virtually, so you don't even have to see us face to face. Uh, we are responsible for that really cool after hours program that started up. Uh, we support the PIT, the Point in Time Homeless Count. We created the Town Halls, which has brought us here today. We're involved in housing related community decision making. Come join us. Yes, exactly. Well, All thank right. you so much for that. Uh, Riveting in depth, yeah. in depth, really, and uh, they can go back and listen to it on there. So next up is Krista, and she's going to talk some more about some of the issues that go along with housing. Hello, uh, so I am Krista Berger, a case manager at the Salvation Army of Spring County. Uh, most people recognize the Salvation Army for some of our larger um, programs, such as the food pantry the emergency shelter, and Christmas assistance. However, there are so many other programs. Um, some of these programs include our work boot program, utility assistance, prescription assistance, summer camp, spiritual care, and partnerships with Made New Again and Catholic Charities. Um, so I encourage you to reach out to the Salvation Army if you are in need of assistance or you have any questions about our program. Um, since our focus tonight is on homelessness, I want to provide you with information on the Emergency Lodge. Um, some data we have specific to the residents that we served in 2021, as well as some trends that we have seen over the past few years. Um, so the Emergency Lodge is a nighttime shelter that is open year round. We are the only emergency shelter in Sheboygan County that is not specific to those fleeing domestic violence. Um, so here are pictures uh, to give you a glimpse into what the emergency lodge looks like. Um, you can see two of our dorms on the bottom, um, our dining area or the main lounge area for our residents, a play area for our families, um, and a kitchen, our kitchen area, which you can see it's dinner time, so it's a little hectic, um, but it looks like they're having some tacos. Um, so due to COVID, we are limited in the number of people we can serve, but we have continued to shelter people throughout the pandemic. The population we serve are individuals 17 years of age or older and families. Um, so the Emergency Lodge is ultimately a program. Our residents are able to stay up to 89 nights and have access to laundry facilities, meals, and most importantly, case management. There are two full-time case managers who work in the emergency lodge and each resident is assigned to one of them. The case manager's role is to be supportive, but at the same time, 
um, hold residents accountable in achieving their goals. Although each resident's situation is different, more often than not, their primary goal is to obtain housing. Um, in an attempt to help our residents find housing, we always make them aware of programs in Sheboygan County that can assist them. These include Lakeshore CAP, the Sheboygan Housing Authority, Rural Housing, Forward Services, and Bridgeway. If a resident is interested, we make a referral to these programs and assist them in completing applications or gathering necessary documents. We also assist residents in working or communicating with landlords and filling out rental applications. Our hope is that homelessness is a once in a lifetime experience. However, we know that due to underlying issues, it can be difficult to get out of homelessness. We will get to underlying issues in a little bit, but I wanna focus on data from the past year um, that was provided to us um, by the residents that we served. Um, so in 2021, the Salvation Army of Sheboygan County served 154 people and provided over 7,000 nights of shelter. Um, through a program called Clarity, homeless service providers have the ability to see if people have stayed in shelters before. Um, so in 2021, 75 of our residents had previously stayed in a shelter and 79 were experiencing their first time in a homeless shelter. For those experiencing their first time in a shelter, it may truly have been their first time being homeless, um, but many of them were living with friends or family, couch surfing, incarcerated, or living in a place not meant for human habitation beforehand. Um, I've been asked numerous times why someone would choose to sleep in a place not meant for human habitation when they can stay in a shelter where it's warm, they have food, a bed, and access to other resources. Um, and I wish there was a simple answer for this, but it all depends upon the individual and their situation. Um, residents have shared that they decided not to seek shelter um, previously because there were no beds available. They were afraid. Uh, they felt more comfortable sleeping outdoors because that's what they were accustomed to or because that other they felt that other people needed shelter more than they did. Um, it can be extremely hard to see someone sleeping in a place not meant for habitation or knowing that they do not have a place to stay that night. Um, and I think that's why so many of us are here tonight um, and everyone here presenting appreciates your interest in this topic. Um, as I stated earlier, there are underlying issues that can lead to homelessness and some of those are mental health, addiction, and health concerns. So in 2021, our residents provided us with the following information. 67 residents reported mental health concerns, 16 reported alcohol abuse, 14 reported drug abuse, and 32 reported both alcohol and drug abuse. On this slide, you can see some of the other underlying issues and how they have impacted our residents as well. These, ne these numbers might actually be higher um, than what I have here because not everyone is comfortable talking about disabilities or struggles with someone they do not know. Um, so in an effort to alleviate some of these issues, the case managers create an individualized plan for each resident. And like I said earlier, make them aware of resources in Sheboygan County that can assist in their specific situation. Um, so if, if the residents are interested in these services, we make the referrals to the providers and assist in getting services started as soon as possible. Um, so in my time with the Salvation Army, I have noticed two barriers that are preventing um, our residents from obtaining housing. The first is criminal history and the second is having a poor rental history. Um, often landlords are unsure about renting to people that um, do not have a clean record, which is completely understandable, but the downside is that this prevents our residents from obtaining housing um, and leads to the continu continuation of their homeless situation. Um, a lot of the residents who come to the shelter admit that they have had at least one rough patch in their life where, for example, they were unemployed um, or had health issues and could not afford rent or they made poor decisions. And ultimately, any of these situations can lead to an eviction and having an eviction on your record makes it so much harder um, to find housing in the future. Um, so many of our residents recognize the negative impact their decisions have had on their life, but they have taken it upon themselves to make the necessary changes to improve their situation. Um, this includes successfully completing Rent Smart through consumer credit counseling, receiving mental health or addiction services, gaining full-time employment, and utilizing other community agencies. 
the residents are hopeful that these changes will give them a better chance of obtaining um, housing that is safe and appropriate. Uh, besides the barriers and struggles our residents are facing, they also have to deal with the stigma of homelessness. Um, homeless individuals are often viewed as outsiders because they do not meet the status quo of society. Um, and as a result, they are often subjected to stares which reinforce their outsider status by either making them invisible or making them visible through negative attention. The outsidership renders people um, experiencing homeless vulner vulnerable to acts of violence, exploitation, um, and extreme social isolation, which can create barriers to stable housing and employment, as well as trigger or worsen mental health and addiction issues. Uh, so ultimately, people experiencing homelessness are looking to fit in with society instead of having a stigma attached to them. They are looking to have a sense of normalcy or stability and a roof over their head that they can call their own and feel safe. Uh, so the final topic I want to address um, is what happens when residents discharge from the emergency lodge. Um, in 2021, we had 33 residents discharged to permanent housing. Um, five went to institutional settings, such as a mental health facility um, or a nursing home. And unfortunately, the remaining 103 left to temporary living situations, such as other shelters, couch surfing with friends or family, um, or a place not meant for human habitation. We would love to see these numbers um, of residents discharging to permanent housing be much higher, but it is extremely difficult to find housing that is safe and affordable when you have the stigma of being homeless, have a criminal history, a poor rental history, or are dealing with mental health or addiction. Um, so we are so thankful that we have landlords and housing providers in Sheboygan County who are willing to give people a second chance um, and let them prove that they are amazing people who have lived through some rough times and are now stable and successful. Um, so all of the homeless service providers truly want to see more people go into permanent housing and the number of people seeking homeless services decrease. Uh, the Salvation Army is working towards ending homelessness, but we are only one piece of the solution. As a community, we need to raise public awareness of the homelessness, encourage community engagement in working towards ending homelessness, and supporting those who are currently experiencing homelessness or are on the verge of homelessness. Um, so I wanna thank you for taking the time to come tonight and learn more about homelessness. And as always, please feel free to reach out if you are in need of assistance or have any questions about our programs. Thank you, Krista. Yes. That's, uh, the, the complexity that goes along with that is, is so intense and yet it needs to be known. Yes. So I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Next is Morgan from Lakeshore Cap, and she's going to continue on telling us a little bit more about their services and also homelessness and housing situations. Morgan. Good evening. My name is Morgan Wyman. I am a supportive housing case manager for the prevention program with Lakeshore Community Action Program, or Lakeshore Cap. Um, I cover Sheboygan County, Manitowoc County, Kewanee County, and Door County. However, most of my clients are in Sheboygan and Manitowoc County. I've been with Lakeshore CAP for four plus years, but I've only been in supportive housing since January of last year. Um, my caseload basically consists of people, it's, it's a process. So my caseload is um, applications that I'm reviewing for eligibility, those who are in the process of entering the CV prevention program, um, and those whose rent I'm currently paying. Some basic eligibility requirements for our current COVID prevention program, um, oh, I'm sorry, COVID prevention funding requires clients to be below the 50% CMI, um, have an eviction notice and or be facing homelessness within 21 days after the date of application for assistance. What, can you what CMI is? It, that, that's coming up. All right. Um, okay. Once a client is enrolled, he or she is required to meet with me on a monthly basis so I can ensure continued eligibility as well as collaborate to de develop a secure housing plan, which includes developing goals and tasks the client will complete to become self sufficient before the program ends. Client goals look something like meeting with consumer credit counseling, 
um, services to do some budget counseling, uh, it, obtaining employment, and finding childcare in order to maintain employment. My job as a case manager is to educate my client on resources in our community in order to accomplish their goals or meet their needs. The prevention program is meant to be a short-term program that can potentially pay arrears, utilities, and three to six months of rent assistance to prevent homelessness. Um, next slide. So this is just taking a look at um, regular prevention versus CV prevention. So pre-COVID, um, we had the regular prevention program um, so clients needed to be at 30% CMI, um, units needed to be at fair market rent and rent reasonable. Um, so the definition would be, so this would include anybody that would be eligible would be individuals or family um, who will imminently lose their primary nighttime residence provided that residents will be lost within 14 days of the date of application for homeless assistance. Um, no subsequent residence has been identified. And the individual or family lacks the resources or support net networks needed to obtain other permanent housing. Um, that, the regular prevention did not have a lot of funding. Um, so that could potentially help maybe a few clients or a few families um, during the year, but when COVID hit, we received more funding for the prevention program, so it kind of relaxed um, those eligibility requirements. So clients needed to be at 50% CMI. Um, units no longer needed to be fair market rent, but they did need to be rent reasonable. Um, and definition, sorry, I can't see. <laughs> Um, has moved because of economic reasons uh, two or, or more times during the, uh, during the 60 days immediately preceding the application for assistance or is living in the home of another uh, because of economic hardship or has been notified that their right to occupy their current housing or living situation would be terminated within 21 days after the date of application for assistance or live in a hotel or motel that is self-paid. Um, so in other words, there was a lot more situations that were eligible for the CV prevention program. Um, with the CV prevention funding, we were allowing um, clients that were doubled up or couch hopping to be eligible for the prevention program. Um, actually moving forward with the regular funding, um, we go back to those strict eligibility requirements where they need to have some type of um, eviction notice from their landlord. Okay. Um, okay, so I kind of touched base on this already. Due to COVID, the prevention program eligibility requirements became more flexible. Um, this meant that individuals and families experiencing couch hopping could now potentially be eligible for the prevention program, whereas pre-COVID they would not be eligible. Eligibility now means um, clients have to be below the 50% CMI, whereas pre-COVID was 30% CMI. Uh, next slide. So this is actually taking a look. So this is... Um, I guess what I use, so when I am determining if a client or household is eligible for our prevention, pro so for CV prevention, we would be looking at that 50%. Um, so like a family of four would need to make $38,500 or less to be eligible for that prevention program. Um, Again, pre-COVID and moving forward, because that CV funding is ending, um, we'll be back at the 30% CMI. So the 30% is, I don't think it's exactly what that middle um, row is, but it's, it's close to it. So moving forward, a family of four would need to make 26,500 or less to be eligible. Um, Okay, and now 
um, a unit has to be at least rent reasonable, if, even if it is in fair market rent. Um, Pre-COVID, units had to be fair market rent. By definition, rent reasonableness or rent, reasonable rent means that the rent may not exceed the rent that is charged for a comparable unit with similar amenities in the same or a similar location in the private unassisted rental market. Next slide. Okay, so I think uh, Emily was looking at 2021. I have 2022. Um, so what that means is um, if a client is eligible for a two-bedroom apartment, um, they would need to find an apartment for $797 with utilities included. Um, okay. On the other hand, fair market rent is generally calculated as the 40th percentile of gross rents for regular standard quality units in a local housing market. Fair market rent is uh, data typically, typically taken from recent move-ins rather than long-term tenants, as long-term tenants generally receive a lower monthly rental rate. Um, because we are able to pass a unit that is rent reasonable, um, even if it's not fair market rent, that kind of gives our clients an opportunity to find more housing, even if it means that it would be a little more pricey than their budget allows. Um, however, with the eviction moratorium in place, much of the pandemic, um, clients had a harder time finding available units because um, tenants couldn't be kicked out during that time. They couldn't be evicted. So there wasn't a whole lot of moving around, I guess you would say. Um, the other problem I, I was finding as a case manager throughout the pandemic is that many units were not passing a ba basic habit habitability inspection. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as a case manager, I would conduct, conduct a basic habitability inspection um, after I determine that a unit is rent reasonable. Um, so I go into the unit and it's just a real basic inspection, just making sure that lights turn on and off, that water turns on and off, that there's warm water, um, that there's working smoke detectors, um, windows must open and shut, things like that. If there's anything wrong with the unit, um, landlords have 30 days to make repairs. Um, and after that, then we would move on to lease signing. Um, so as I was saying, uh, many units were not passing a base, basic habitability inspection. Um, so again, on the slide, you know, some of them, the windows aren't opening and closing. Um, and landlords have the option to make those repairs and some landlords were not making those repairs. And um, so therefore clients are forced to find housing elsewhere. They have to move on to finding another apartment if the landlord is not willing to make those repairs. While my prevention clients search for housing, they are issued a housing coupon a housing coupon is a document that states how many people are in the household and how many bedrooms a, a client is eligible for. It also states the steps moving forward, which um, include submitting a request for unit approval form, which the landlord fills out and returns to the case manager, which is me. Um, and then from there, I would ca calculate rent reasonableness and complete that inspection. Each housing coupon is good for 30 days. Um, so with CV prevention, I was able to um, issue, you know, two, three, four um, housing coupons to allow clients more time to find an apartment. Um, there have been instances where I've issued five housing coupons to a client um, and they just, they can't find the housing. They just, they can't find something that is affordable or something that passes that inspection or they just can't find any available units. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what the supportive housing um, programs look like pre-COVID, but what I can say is that it has surely been busy for the past year. At times my caseload feels unmanageable. 
The applications keep coming in faster than I can process them. Some weeks I receive five to 10 applications for supportive housing. The amount of missed calls, voicemails, and emails that I have on a daily basis is not something I experienced before January of last year. I have had clients so desperate for housing that they have gone off on me, cussed me out, and even cried to me on the phone. Yes, I have heard much older men cry on the phone explaining to me that they got hurt at work and have no clue where to go or what to do because disability is not coming in just yet. Excuse me. I have spoken with seniors who are living out of a vehicle or garage because that, what, that is what life has brought them to. Ultimately, the reason they can't find housing is because many of them are on a fixed income and they can't find affordable housing in Chewing County. Sometimes I feel stressed out and frustrated myself that I cannot immediately help those who need help immediately. I empathize with those who are vulnerable and need help as I have been in their shoes too. Sometimes my eyes fill with tears and I carry my workload home and think to myself, only if the rest of Sheboygan County sees what I see and hears what I hear every single day. What I am seeing with applications that end up on my desk is that those applying for rent assistance are mostly individuals who are literally homeless, that means sleeping in a car, outside, or in a place not meant for human habitation, or an emergency shelter. Those fleeing domestic violence, seniors, those getting hurt at work, and individuals and families who are couch hopping. Many of these applicants are in crisis mode. Many of them don't know the resources here in Sheboygan County. Many lack the supports and resources to obtain and or maintain housing, especially when many of them are in a fixed income and or their landlord increases the rent. Uh, next slide. So the Sheboygan County pit or point in time. Um, so Lakeshore Cap leads the point in time or pit count every year in January and in July. The pit count is an event where volunteers go out from either 11 p.m. to 2 p.m. or 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. throughout Sheboygan County and identify individuals who may be experiencing homelessness and try to connect them with resources and personal hygiene items if they need them. The next morning we do an outreach event where we also try connecting those experiencing homelessness with housing and resources. Each year we are identifying more individuals experiencing homelessness than the previous year, I would say overall. Um, so taking a look at the numbers, January 2021, three individuals were found. July 2021, six individuals were found. Um, and we just completed the January 2022, uh, what, a week or two ago now? I don't know. <laughs> um, and we found five, is that correct, Abby? Five individuals were found. Um, Lakeshore Cap also participates in the Health for the Homeless Hygiene Drive um, every year, something we are participating in again this year. Um, the Health for the Homeless Hygiene Drive is held by agencies including Lakeshore Cap, Safe Harbor, St. Vinny's, um, Salvation Army, the Production Farm, Love Inc., um, Sheboygan County Interfaith Organization, and Catholic Charities um, to collect personal hygiene items and household supplies. These donations are divided up amongst the agencies that participate, and we are able to provide um, those items to the clients we serve who are in need of those items. In the past, Lakeshore Cap had a hard time getting rid of those donations that we would receive through the drive. Um, this past year, we probably gave most of our stuff away. Um, so initially, we weren't going to participate in the drive uh, this next time around. And uh, Abby and I looked over at our shelves and realized that we have like nothing left. Um, so it was kind of a last minute decision, like we need to participate in this drive again because um, clearly our clients really need these items. Um, our clients depend on us and we want to support them in any way possible, even if it's just providing a toothbrush and toothpaste. 
Um, as mentioned before, that CBA funding that we have is actually ending in April. Um, so we are at this point determining eligibility based on that regular um, prevention. Um, however, I want to remind the community members that there is WIRA assistance available and to apply for that assistance, um, either through Lakeshore CAP or ESI. Our staff wants to accommodate you the best way that we can, whether that's making referrals outside of our agency or sending your paperwork um, for another agency to that agency. Just a reminder that we're not perfect and although we want to help, assist and house everyone, we simply don't have the resources to do so. Supportive housing is not emergency assistance, so we encourage community members and our clients to get to know the other resources other resources we have in this community and to utilize those other resources. Um, and with that being said, it is Abby's turn. Oh, perfect. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Abby Reese. My role is the Supportive Housing Outreach Coordinator for Lakeshore Community Action Program. Uh, that role is multifaceted, so part of that role is I oversee this process on the lakeshore. So that includes, as Morgan said before, Sheboygan, Manitowoc, Door, and Kiwani counties, um, called coordinated entry. So coordinated entry is essentially a process that the government housing programs, so specifically government housing programs that include intensive case management, use to prioritize households for services. We do have to do this because we simply do not have enough funding to serve everyone in our one program, although I wish we did. Overseeing this process means determining who is next for services, when a case manager can work with a new household, working with other agencies to help them understand the process, um, reviewing data for accuracy, outreach activities, and also reviewing data for who is referred for different programs um, and trends and gaps in that programming. I also work as a rapid rehousing case manager. Rapid rehousing is a medium term case man intensive case management program for individuals experiencing homelessness. And when I'm talking about homelessness, I'm specifically talking about individuals who are um, living in a place not meant for human habitation or an emergency shelter. Um, our work, so the work of um, homeless service providers, as Morgan just said before, and you kind of, kind of caught the wind of, um, is extremely daunting. It's incredibly difficult. Um, seeing housing insecurity every day uh, is, is really actually painful, um, but I try to remember that if it's painful for me, it's a thousand times painful for the people actually living it in that moment. Um, while this work has always been difficult, COVID has certainly elevated the crisis here in Sheboygan County. In conversations, I've also noted that, noticed that this is the first time many of our households are really in need of housing assistance and are really experiencing housing crisis. I truly think that a big piece of this is that we are currently living in a world of constant chaos, and that is more traumatic than it previously was. Also, let's be honest, all of our systems have imperfections, and we do our best to fix these imperfections as we notice them. I think part of what we are also seeing are these imperfections of multiple housing systems being exasperated. For example, we intersect affordability, or lack of affordability, um, in the form of rising housing and rental, rental costs, and um, really just rising costs of basic needs overall. With a middle class that actually has stagnating wages, um, and it's really not a surprise that we have a housing crisis on our hands. Um, in fact, last year, we had uh, the wages increased by an average of 4.8%, but if we include inflation, wages were actually down 1.9% from 2020. Okay. So if we can just go to the next slide. Perfect, okay. So at Lakeshore Community Action Program, we work in programs that do assist with financial assistance, but I believe there's often this misconception that our programs are financial assistance alone. Um, our actual, actually our permanent housing programs are intensive case management programs that come along with that financial assistance, right? So these programs tend to prioritize those individuals with the most vulnerabilities and barriers in either obtaining housing in the first place or removing themselves from, or maintaining housing, sorry, or removing themselves from homelessness. In order to do this, we use a process called coordinated entry that I talked about before. 
Um, we utilize our application and applications and evidence-based assessments in our process of referring individuals to programs. That information determines how a person is prioritized for a program. While the process is not perfect, um, there's always, there's constant efforts to improve it, and actually most of the state works on improving it all the time. Uh, the reason this process was put into place was that in the past, each agency receiving this federal funding for these intensive case management programs, um, actually were, they were making policies on their own um, about who is most appropriate for programs. And oftentimes what that meant is that they were making policies about who they thought would be most successful in that program. Um, and while it wasn't intentional, sometimes that was a little bit biased, right? So then the government kind of came along with our housing first practices and they said no more doing that because everybody's housing ready, ready and you shouldn't be picking and choosing who gets housing. Um, so that's how the coordinated entry kind of came along. Um, and it attempts to prioritize those who need housing the most by putting everyone at an equal starting point. It attempts to provide equity in how we pr prioritize individuals, putting everyone through the same process and prioritization. Coordinated entry also allows us to coordinate services throughout the state with other counties. Right, so if we want to go to the next slide, yeah. So we also get so a lot of much needed data that we need for, for our community um, in something called prioritization lists. So what happens is after we make these referrals, when our housing case managers can take on a new household, we run a list of everybody who has been referred and we call them prioritization lists because they prioritize the order in which we should offer household services. Um, and so while people are waiting, we have kind of a snapshot, right, on any given day of what homelessness kind of looks like in our community. So I took some numbers. So because all of these numbers come from Sheboygan, Manitowoc, Door, and Kewanee counties, I had to kind of separate, separate out the Sheboygan referrals and who was actually residing here. Um, so I found out, and this is from mid-January, there are, were 42 households in Sheboygan County at, on one specific day, so it was January 17th, experiencing homelessness, um, and that totaled 64 individuals. Um, 12 of those households were fleeing domestic violence, so that is 28.6% of our homeless population here. 25 of those households identified that they had a disability, which is 59.5% of our homeless population. Nine were experiencing chronic homelessness, um, so that's 21.4% of our, our homeless population. And when I'm referring to chronic homelessness, it's essentially an individual who has a disability, but they also have been homeless for 12 months or more in the last three years. Um, we had two veterans, which was 4.8% of our homeless population. Um, and that number really never gets much higher. It's actually mostly zero. Uh, our veteran services are phenomenal here. Um, and we had one youth at that time, 2.4%. Um, and that number doesn't get much higher either, and I can accredit some of our fantastic youth programs to that as well. Um, and then households spent an average of 60 days on that priority list, um, and individuals come off for a number of reasons. Sometimes we pull them into our programming, sometimes they resolve their own issues, sometimes they just disappear. Um, you know, that's kind of, those are the main reasons, I would say. Sometimes they just don't wanna be on that list anymore, and that's completely up to them. Um, if we go to the next slide, I actually took that information and then I looked at a priority list or prioritization list I had saved from January 2021 and I compared the numbers. Um, I didn't have the numbers of individuals from 2021 just because we used a different database and our referrals only included one person. Um, but as you can see, the numbers are actually uh, quite a bit higher. Um, so I think the number for January 2021 is we had 27 households experiencing homelessness. Um, so I just kind of wanted to show a brief comparison for everybody. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. All right. So what's so stressful about being homeless, right? Um, whether chronically homeless or first-time homeless, being homeless is traumatic. Individuals who become homeless for the first time deal with a whole lot of loss. They lose their once safe, warm place to sleep. They might lose personal possession. And then a life that they once had seems to evaporate right in front of them. Experiencing homelessness is a trauma in and of itself. You have to learn to share space in a shelter and follow rules that you never had to follow before. Find places to safe to sleep in the elements if you're sleeping outside. 
Learn to be highly aware of your surroundings and be on constant alert, alert that there's nothing around you to protect you. Another form of trauma is, a community, is community judgment and assumptions of how an individual may have become homeless, who they are because they are homeless, and how a person should remove themselves from homelessness. Additionally, traumatic events often lead to homelessness. This might be a one-time occurrence or perhaps a multitude of a traumatic events throughout one's life. Furthermore, consider the concept of time. How far in advance do you think the time horizon is for someone who, is, who doesn't know where they'll be tomorrow? While you and I can probably see you know, at least five, 10 years out, someone experiencing homelessness, especially chronic homelessness, likely cannot see past the next day or two. I would like to focus some of our energy on the, this piece, this time piece, right? Specifically on how it contributes to chronic homelessness. Um, so like somebody who can't pick themselves out of homelessness. Um, in general, around 70 to 80% of individuals do resolve their own homeless issues and we wanna support and empower right, that self-resolution. Sheboygan County's number seems to be slightly on the higher end of that average. Um, so since we talked about chronic homelessness before and we have about 21.4% of our homeless individuals chronically homeless, that, that means about 78.6% of the individuals here are likely resolving their homelessness, um, even if that means they're doubling up. What I mean is they're getting themselves out of being back on the street. Um, so in my discussion below on trauma, or coming up on trauma, I'm going to be referring to this 21.4% of our population not resolving their own homelessness. Um, I wanna focus on this specifically because I think there's just a lot of misconceptions about behaviors and, and where they come from. So I believe that a lot of behaviors that some of us see as what keeps individuals in homelessness often stem from this inability to see their life existing beyond 24 hours in a combination with past trauma. Why? Because trauma literally changes our brain and how it functions. Trauma limits the responses from our reasoning part of our brain, which is right up in front, our prefrontal cortex. Um, and then it also just emphasizes the responses from the back of our brain, which is our amygdala, which is literally where we get our survival uh, mechanisms from. This means, in general, someone experiencing chronic homelessness will look at um, far more situations than the average person as a situation where they need to survive. We see these responses as flight, fight, or freeze and sometimes these responses seem dramatic or excessive to those who don't understand them. In all reality, they are just someone trying to survive because their brain has essentially changed and there's literally no promise of tomorrow. This is why it can be extremely difficult for someone experiencing homeless, homelessness to just simply pick themselves up out of that position. How do you plan for a future when you can't imagine one existing? All of this can change, but it takes lots of work and support. In order to change this, we need to build individual and community resilience. It is not overnight, and I like to remind others that people with chronic trauma are not like cars going through a car wash. Um, I often hear these ideas that, you know, we help somebody once or they go through a program and they should come out squeaky clean like a car going through a car wash, but people just don't work that way. They're complex and real and they need more than one grand gesture to get them through things. Um, fixing homelessness at its core means completely changing the way we see others. It's a community transformation of our perceptions. Movement in the right direction is going to take change, flexibility, and advocacy from all spheres of housing, so for-profit, non-profit, and government. We can't go back and change the past, but we can learn from the past and our present and change the future. We hope that you, the community, will be part of the solution building in this future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abby, and thank you, Morgan, for Lakeshore Cap and for what you guys do and the difficulties that you outlined just now, but an understanding of the greater picture that goes with that also. Yeah. Um, next up is Stephen, and he's going to talk a little bit about the, the warming center, the Sheboygan County Warming Center. Do you have a brief slide? It's just our logo. It's okay. No, Morgan can talk. So sorry. Oh. I almost forgot. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> it's just really brief. So. Um, we, we often get questions about how the eviction process works. 
Um, to be completely honest, we don't have all the answers about how the eviction process works. Um, with the prevention program, we, um, we require like a five day notice. So that's kind of what we see most. Um, but overall, we just wanna say, um, we encourage you to read through your lease um, and to get to know and utilize your resources. Um, we typically use Legal Action of Wisconsin and Tenant Resource Center, and that's um, typically what we, you know, encourage our, our clients to utilize as well. Hello, my name is Steve Ginther. I am the Director of Operations for the Sheboygan County Warming Center. My job is to make sure the Warming Center runs smoothly, and so far this year has been a great challenge. In 2016, when my wife asked me to be a volunteer for the Warming Center, I replied, why? This is Sheboygan, we don't have a homeless, we don't have homeless people here. Boy, was I wrong. I don't recall what my vision of a homeless person was back then, but I'm fairly certain that back then, they were right in front of me and I just chose not to see them. <clears throat> All it took was to work a couple nights at the as a volunteer at the Warming Center to help me open my eyes, and there they were. And when I'm talking homeless people, I guess I'm talking the category one that was mentioned prior to this. These are the people who are living underneath the bridges, in the parks, and in the parks as campers and so forth. So as for the other categories, we're, just, we're primarily focused on category one. <clears throat> Let me introduce you into the warming center. The Warming Center started as a vision of St. John's UCC, who organized local interdenominational churches, community organizations, friends, and acquired the support of local government with the sole purpose of giving the homeless people in Sheboygan a warm meal and a place to spend the night during the cold winter nights. There, were, there are no criteria for staying at the Warming Center. You basically only need to walk in the door. We are a true no judgment zone. <clears throat> the vision grew so that in 2017, we started our first year in, of operation in the basement of the Salvation Army, totally supported by volunteers. Our first year started slow with four to eight guests per night. And we only had, we were only open for one month, January. By 2020, our nightly guest counts increased from 14 to 20 per night, and we were open from the 1st of January till the 1st of March, helping over 40 individuals. In 2021, because of COVID, we were forced to find a new location, St. Cyril's Methodius Catholic Church, and trim our days to four days per week for only the month of January. <clears throat> With the help of St. Vincent de Paul, Lakeshore Cap, the Sheboygan County Food Bank, and numerous church organizations and private individuals, we opened our doors on December 27, 2021. The first day we started, we had five homeless people with the expectation of only having one. On day two, we had 15 homeless people people with the expectation of only having two. From that day on, <clears throat> we acquired from 13 to 18 individuals per night with providing, in the first 20 days, with providing up to 300 sleepovers, what we refer to as sleepovers, a cot for each night. The warming center is not a rehabilitation center. We are a low hurdle rescue center. What does that mean? That any homeless person that presents themselves <clears throat> is welcome without question. They are provided with shelter and food with no questions, and we ask them only for their name and any special needs, and they are asked to follow some very simple rules. Number one, they must be an adult over the age of 18. No alcohol or illegal drugs are allowed on the property. No foul language, no physical contact, 
with staff, volunteers, and guests. Smoking is de designated areas at designated times. Personal areas should be kept clean and tidy. It is required that all that personal belongings be stored in bins in the designated area. Personal hygiene should be maintained and they must show respect and be courteous to staff, volunteers, and all guests. If they break any of the rules, <clears throat> they will be asked to leave the warming center for the night or permanently. The other thing is the homeless, the Sheboygan County Warming Center can only accommodate up to 20 people and the first 20 people that present themselves at the door are admitted. After 20 people, we so far knocking on wood this year, we've only hit 20 once. <clears throat> Why is the Sheboygan County Warming Center so important? Our greatest value is we are a low barrier, no judgment shelter. We ask only for your name and if they have any special needs, we accept all guests without prejudice. <clears throat> Let me tell you that this opens your door to a lot of unique guests. Um, most of our guests fall in the category of addicts, unemployed, alcoholics, <clears throat> who are seeking a warm place out of the weather. Some of our guests will stay, have stayed with us from the beginning and will probably leave us in mid-March. Um, but a large percent of it will stay a few days, then find a couch on a friend's, at a friend's house for a few days, then show up at the shelter again a couple days later. <clears throat> to give you an example, let me tell you about one of our more colorful guests, and I will refer to him as Mike. Mike showed up on our, up on our, in our facility on day two, he checked in just like everyone else, but it seemed he knew most of, our, of the, <clears throat> his fellow homeless. He, he, was, he was a take charge kind of guy. Um, if one of the guests would get out of line, he would talk to them and tell them how appreciative he should be or they should be, <clears throat> and they should because they could be out in the cold. So we nicked him, Mike the mayor of the shelter. But then the tide changed and he started, and he started showing up mildly intoxicated until he came in very intoxicated and was very vocal that night. The rest of the guests didn't like it. The following morning I had a conversation that he needed to curb his drinking, but he didn't listen. Two nights later, he came in very drunk and more vocal than ever. In the morning, we had a conversation about the rules of the shelter, and the next time he showed up drunk, he would not be let in. That night, we received a phone call from the police department that <clears throat> drunk Mike needed a place to stay. I then realized that it only took less than seven days to go from Mike, from going from Mike the mayor of the shelter to being referred to as Drunk Mike. I then put on my jacket to wait for the officer and Mike in the parking lot because I was not gonna let Mike in to the shelter if he was intoxicated. The officer informed me that Mike was not drunk and that he, he had spent the past five hours at the hospital trying to dry, dry, dry out and kept st telling the nurses, Steve won't let me in if I'm drunk. Mike spent the night, the following day we talked and he stated he needed to make a change in his life. And I suggested the, a couple of the local agencies and he thanked me and left for the day. Later that day, he contacted me and he's, he, that he was checking into the hospital to dry out and that he was going to the Salvation Army because he needed structure in his life in order to stay clean. A couple days later, I gave Mike a ride to the Salvation Army 
dropped them off at the door, and wished him luck. <clears throat> Most of our guests are not as colorful and dramatic as Mike. Most of our guests check into the warming center between 7 and 7.45, set up their bed, eat dinner, and are fast asleep by 9.30 p.m. Then they're back on the road, out on the street again by 7 a.m. But over the weeks, you get over the weeks you get to know them. Some of them will some of them will tell you that they have found employment, and a week or two later, they're gone. They're back, and they have found a house to stay in or somewhere to sleep on a couch. As you walk away, you take pride in knowing you might have helped them just a little bit to get out of their situation. Just to recap, we are located at St. Cyril's on New Jersey Avenue. We are open from 7 p.m. till 7 a.m., seven days a week. We accept everyone. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate, you appreciate that update on the Warming Center, the Sheboygan County Warming Center. Yeah. And now uh, let's move on. We're going to have Michael tell us some lived experience and, and his story to share with us. Thanks, Michael. Oh, I'll switch seats. On you, sorry. Oh, hello. Um, so I, I really appreciate um, Abby, you invite me here, and I know everyone at this table. Um, they're doing phenomenal work. Um, and um, my story is um, pretty much um, a story of redemption. Um, my current role is um, I'm the executive director of the Haven of Manitowoc County Men's Homeless Shelter Program in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Um, I've been there for seven years. And um, my um, beginning um, re really started through trauma, like was, you know, we, we, we talked about, um, you hear the deep-rooted root trauma, um, and based off what people go through um, really kind of formulates their character and the, this the decisions they make. Um, it wasn't that I went, you know, was constantly in um, in trouble or anything like that. I, you know, have a degree in music and um, end up dropping out of school before I finished um, that degree. Um, but, you know, when you get to a certain point um, and you realize that you know, there's this voice that says that you won't amount to anything, but you don't know where the voice comes from. Um, that's what I battled a lot. And um, it really ended up with me um, leaving college. Um, ended up, um, I was married and had two children. And um, from there, um, Ended up addicted to crack cocaine, um, and didn't do, and end up going to prison. Um, I was in and out of jail, and um, you know I couldn't really um, put things together. You know, here I am, an educated person. I'm not like those people. You know, I thought, you know, you ask the question, well, how do you find yourself here, right? So my First in jail wasn't good enough. Then I went back to doing drugs and then um, ended up being evicted out of my apartment. And um, just knowing that once that door closed to that apartment, like all I had was my car. Um, that, you know, there was nothing um, in terms of emergency services that I can get into. Um, I was able to get into a, a shelter that you only stay, you, you only can stay three days at a time. And then I was back on the street, um, couch surfing. And then um, there was a time um, when I had gotten to a point where 
either I was going to get help or complete suicide. So I had a plan to do that. Um, but, you know, my last day doing drugs, I remember that um, I needed to make one more phone call just to see if something was available. And when I made that phone call, someone was available. Um, that was my first um, introduction to some type of services, some type of resources um, that I was able to say, you know, I need someone to save my life, I need, I need help. Um, you know, there was no one there, there was none of my friends there. Um, you know, I continued to do drugs. I hadn't seen my kids for over two years. It was, it was the most traumatic experience. And it's, it, it really doesn't, it comes down to, yeah, if you experience trauma, but then you are also living through the trauma you've inflicted on others um, because of your behavior. Um, a lot of people don't really talk about that. Um, they talk about, well, um, this is what happened to them, but then um, another level of that is how does one forgive themselves in order to really take themselves to the next level and accept the help um, that's available. So I was able to get what they call in Minnesota, called in Minnesota at the time was Rule 25. Um, I went to treatment and I've been clean since August 11, 2006. So um, I have over 15 years clean and from there, um, you know, I saw that I could live a life without drugs. Um, I uh, began to um, have a relationship with my children again. Um, I went back to the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire in, um, in 2007 and got my music performance degree. I earned that, went back and received that. And um, um, my felony charge um, um, of theft um, was turned around to a misdemeanor and I was able to work in um, um, human services for the first time and um, applied for a leadership position, you know, just to see if, if I can do it. Um, and um, being on probation at the time, I had 15 years of probation, um, but that was reduced and um, I was done with probation um, April 30th of 2012. Um, my children live in Manitowoc and in 2014 I moved to Manitowoc and I've been executive director of the Haven um, ever since. So it's um, one of the um, issues that um, people like myself who experience homelessness and sometimes the criminalization of homelessness is that people believe um, the stigma is that it's a social issue, that it's a moral failing, but it's really a poverty issue. You know, you don't have the resources, you don't have the money. Um, um, you know, due to some mental health, you probably can't keep the job, but everyone sitting here at this table is put in position to help someone um, who will get it. It might take them six or seven times, it might take them once, um, it took me quite a few times, and um, I was in and out of, the, out of the halfway house. I didn't want to listen. I, you know, I but I knew there was only one way for me to get help, and that's to have full acceptance of the services. Um, but what if those services weren't there? Um, especially for a single man at the time, there was no emergency services. Um, there was 70% chance that a German Shepherd can get housed quicker than I could. Um, so um, those are some scary statistics, which still rules today. Um, but in being able to accept those services and um, um, have those doors opened, you know, really saved my life. Being at the halfway house, being in a prison reentry program. Um, you know, all those things. There was a Salvation Army program I was um, a part of in Rochester, Minnesota um, at the time. And um, it's, you know, because of the mental health services I was able to get, it was because of, you know, the counseling. Um, 
you know, to help me put together um, a body of work to forgive myself first and foremost for what I have done and that what happened to me wasn't my fault. Um, but it, it really put into perspective that those people, those individuals, those agencies um, that provided those services um, never shut the door. And these people will never shut the door. Um, and it's, you know, we're not gonna be able to save everyone, you know, um, and what I do, I know men have died. It's, it's, it's something that we have to deal with daily, but I am um, pretty much the poster child for what I do um, every day. It's not like work to me, but um, my lived experience, um, you know, really has proven to be um, an asset to what I do and to the men that we serve um, and to be able to come here to Sheboygan and, and share that lived experience um, is, is really, really important. Um, and, and I know, you know, a lot of men, you know, they really have a hard time. It's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a different time, um, a lot of suicide. Um, and, you know, we're trying to look at things differently, um, not just for men, but for homeless individuals and families as well. Um, you know, that the door stays open um, and that, um, you know, we could actually um, gain integrity again, you know, by being able to look somebody in the eye and actually ask for help. And I just believe that every homeless individual um, has built their character. If they've gotten through this alive, um, is based on their ability to ask for help. Um, and to um, take advantage of those services um, as well. And they can take you um, far. And, you know, I'm living proof of that. So um, I'm glad that I got a chance to come and, and kind of share with everyone um, what I've gone through and, and what I continue to go through, even as a professional. And, and, you know, there's still some traumatic events that pop in my mind that, I know how to take care of myself and who to call and all those things. So the, the thing is, is that trauma um, never goes away, um, but you learn how to live with it. Um, you learn how to live through it and you know how to um, help others to help them live through it and go through it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was uh, very moving on your experience, and uh, and it, it really does take a relationship, a re relationship to one another, and it takes relationships of agencies, and I think that tonight we talked about a lot of that in the agencies, and it takes resources, and that, that, that hit home tonight, too. So um, we are getting close to the end of the hour, uh, second hour that's here. And I, we, we have asked you that on the registration form that you put questions down. And we have these questions that we are going to tackle come the fourth session. So next session, next session is the um, Sheboygan Housing study, the city of Sheboygan. The Sheboygan County Economic Corporation is going to be talking about ARPA and uh, the uh, American Rescue Plan and affordab the affordable and workforce housing. And then we're going to have a business perspective individual here also talking about affordability and workforce um, affordability. I, I hope you see the progression that that's happening here in these town halls. We're trying to build upon a greater understanding across um, housing being all about that relationship, all about the understanding of poverty, of, about understanding the people, and understanding the resources that go along with that. Um, if we didn't get to your question, I know you maybe want to, um, we have a moment or two. We'll let you unmute if you really want to ask a question, if you're burning for it, for to ask that question. So feel free to unmute if you'd like to ask a question. 
to anyone on the panel on regarding what we've talked about today. Are there any questions in the chat? Well, we have questions, but uh, in the chat box that uh, no, there actually there's a lot of thank yous to all of you in the chat box. So, way to go, people. Mm -hmm. All right. If you do happen to have questions, feel free on the next next town hall, which is on the seventeenth. It's two weeks from today. Um, to put those questions in there. And we will be tackling them on that day or on the fourth one, which will be a cumulative panel of people that have been up here before or some new faces possibly. And we will be discussing a lot of the questions that come through um, at that period of time. Anyone else have a comment? Chad's got a question in the audience. Chad. Oh, he's going to the question. Oh, he's going to the podium oh. in there. So I, very well done to the panelists. But I, the question, I guess I just in, in and I maybe can touch on this when I speak next time. But um, when I'm listening to all the panelists, particularly the Lakeshore Cap folks, um, you know, one thing that comes to mind is the housing quality issues that resonate across the county. And I think, you know, one thing that wasn't it would be an interesting topic is, you know, how do we overcome those challenges? Because, you know, the state legislature has kind of tied municipal hands from doing code enforcement programs in elect in internal, uh, you know, residential units um, prior to some legislation back in 2017. You could do a rental inspection program and building inspectors could go into homes and or rental units on like a five year cycle and be able to make sure they're up to those quality standards. That uh, allowability has been taken away by the legislature, which has, you know, clearly proven to be a challenge for people to find quality housing moving forward that meets those minimum housing quality standards. So, you know, I think I don't have the answer, but I think, you know, as we talk about housing issues um, across the nation, but particularly across Wisconsin and Sheboygan County, you know, if there's any uh, times where we can talk to our legislatures, we should be sharing the information with them about the challenges that we do have housing issues within, you know, housing quality standard issues within our housing units and, you know, what are the, some of the tools that the state can help municipalities with to make sure that these properties are up to code and are safe for people to reside in. So thank you. Thank you, Chad. Can I have the mic? You, yours is on. Am I on? Oh, I can't see the red. Okay. Um, in addition to that, when we look at it, like homeowners and landlords, some of these repairs that we're looking at are really costly and there just isn't the money. Um, you know, I had a friend who actually had to tear their garage down because they couldn't afford the repairs necessary to bring it up to what the code needed to be. Um, and, you know, and now you're down a garage, which means your property value is even farther down, you know. So there's pieces of this when you say, like, you know, the home inspections, and if we inspected better, maybe we could enforce some of this better. But also there's that funding piece that, that you know, we, we know how much it costs to build a building right now, you know, construction costs and whatnot. Repair costs are really costly at this point too. So looking at the concepts around assistance in those areas might be something that we could discuss and look at as we move forward too. So hopefully this is something that you could look at even further next session on the 17th that everyone's gonna register for. I, I do believe that will come up next uh, session because those are some of the recommendations of the Affordable Housing and Workforce Development and the city um, has been put forth. So a lot of that will be discussed next time also. So thank you, Chad. And, and also thank the city for opening up the venue here, allowing us to talk about these important issues, bring them forward. Hopefully, as you tuned in, you see the need for connecting and getting our resources. And if you want to get involved, reach out to the Housing Coalition. Honestly, that is the best way for us to, or the city, reach out, get involved, and and help us to come up with working solutions. That's, and help us facilitate change. Help us facilitate change. Yes, that's the, that's the tagline. So 
I thank you for uh, joining us this evening and have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.